Now I think you're recording. It's turned red now, and I think you're recording. Okay, thanks. I'll just repeat the last thing I said. The outline for this discussion is imaging densities, radiology modalities, cost of procedures, dose of procedures, and we'll review some cases. Using this interactive format in this very unique circumstances, I don't know how many cases we'll get through, but it doesn't matter. We'll uh, just the, the discussion will take on its own life. And if we get through just a few cases, that's just fine. If you were to start by looking at this radiograph and you were uh, in a clinical situation and someone asked you to interpret it, there might be the inclination to shout out a diagnosis, to jump straight to something that seems like a reasonable conclusion to you, like pneumoperitoneum or bowel obstruction or tumor. The problem usually with jumping straight to a diagnosis is that often it's wrong. And often it's because you, uh, as the interpreter, are, are not looking at the different radiographic densities that are presented to you and drawing a conclusion from the densities that you see. Let's go into that in a little more detail. This is a painting of a mountain in France uh, called Saint-Victoire. Cézanne, uh, who painted it, had his workshop right at the foot of this mountain. So he painted it many, many times. And he probably used a palette that looked something like this in painting that. Around the perimeter of his palette, he would have had numerous colors. And then at the center of his palette, he would have been able to mix those colors into innumerable different hues. So that as we look at this painting, and if you look just below where the palette now sits, there's a little rectangle of, a, of an orange hue. And your mind tells you, even though there's very little detail, based on the orange, and based on the, that that orange is the same color orange as all those terracotta roofs in the center of the painting, your mind tells you that's a depiction of another little house or business with a terracotta roof. And really the main clue you have is that it, it's the right shade, it's the right hue. So in radiology, we also have a palette of hues. We have a much more limited palette than what Cezanne had available to him. We have only five colors in radiography. And in fact, they're not even colors. They're all shades of gray. But we have five basic shades of gray. And using only those five shades of gray, we represent all different materials that might be represented on the radiograph. Every medical device, every body tissue, every disease process has to be represented using just five shades of gray. If this radiograph were presented, even if you had no medical training at all, you would probably jump to the conclusion that there's something wrong in the right hemithorax. If you were to just jump straight to a diagnosis, someone might say that's a pneumothorax. That would be wrong because the density presented here is the wrong radiographic density for a pneumothorax. So if you back up a step and say, what is the density that is uh, the abnormality? And you think of all the things that go with that density, you're gonna be a lot more successful in interpreting radiographs. So here we go. Let's start with uh, Sabina. Sabina, can you turn on your microphone? We're gonna have a little discussion about this slide. Would that be okay? You betcha. I did not choose you randomly, Sabina. I tuned into one of the lectures yesterday and saw that of all the students who were there, 20 or so students, you were the only person who figured out a case of longus coli tendonitis. That was pretty amazing. <laughs> I did have to look that up because I felt a little uh, undercompetent because I'm, a, I'm, I'm the only uh, second year in the class. So I had to look it up ahead of time, but yes. <laughs> Impressive <Okay. laughs> performance. So in this uh, slide, there are five different shades of gray represented, just to represent the five hues that we use in radiographs. And the lists on the slide are the lists of different tissues or materials that go along with those in order. 
So on the left in those lists would be the most radio dense, the thing that blocks the most x-rays, the thing that shows up the widest on the x-ray. And on the right would be the thing that is the least radio dense, the thing that shows up the blackest on an x-ray. Which of those three lists, Sabina, is in the proper order? Okay, so uh, we know that the widest density is the most dense, which is metal. So that leaves us with answer, either top answer or bottom answer, uh, followed by bone. Um, and then those two are the same. The least dense um, tissue or substance in this list is air. And that's the same in both answers in the top and the bottom. So now we're just deciding between fat and soft tissue. Um, gosh. And I would guess soft tissue is a little bit more dense than fat, maybe because it's a little bit more vascular sometimes, soft tissue encompassing muscle, cartilage. So I would go with the bottom answer, but please don't judge me too harshly. No judgment, Sabina. That was excellent. Thank you. So uh, the bottom answer is correct. That is the correct order. And that's important to remember. The, distinguish the, uh, the distinction you were working through in your mind as you came up with the right answer is important to remember. Fat is less dense than soft tissue on radiographs. Another thing you mentioned that's important is that soft tissue encompasses a lot of different tissues. In radiography, we cannot differentiate between fluid, muscle, parenchyma of various solid organs, cartilage. All of those things fall under one density, and we call it soft tissue density. All right, so here's a case of an abdominal radiograph in an infant. And uh, if you were to go through the five densities here, you would certainly be able to pick out that there's some metal density. Uh, so there's a skin staple there, which is the, the whitest thing on the radiograph, and that's metal. I want to point out something else to you here, and that's the letter L on the uh, patient's left side of the image. That L, which is sort of obliquely positioned, is not something that was added in after the radiograph was made as a as a uh, annotation to the radiograph. That's actually part of the radiograph. The technologist who obtained this uh, image used a little marker that the technologist carries around and placed that marker on the detector right next to the patient. That's important because when this image gets processed or when this image gets interpreted, nobody can ever separate that little letter L from the left side of the patient. No matter how the image is flipped or rotated or manipulated, that L will always be associated with the left side of the patient. That avoids medical errors based on the side of the patient that is imaged. So uh, this is a photograph of one of my friends at Primary Children's. This She's holding up her badge, and on her badge there are three different rectangles. They're wrapped in uh, transport tape so that they can be stuck onto a x-ray detector. Uh, she has her initials CT on two of them, and then she has an, a left detector, a left marker and a right marker. She makes those using these little lead letters that uh, we have in the department. And so uh, she can make the left, her initials, and then on, and then on the top she has one with an arrow uh, that's to point which way is up if it's confusing on some radiographs. So every radiography technologist uses these markers. So as we go back to review the image, we always know which side of the patient is imaged and which technologist took the image. Um, bones, uh, I think you can all identify. The soft tissues, as Sabina told us, uh, are going to be sort of this intermediate density. I pointed here to the liver, but I could have also pointed to that big soft tissue density in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen, or I could have pointed to the skeletal muscles along the anterior surface of the femur. I could have pointed to the heart. All of those are th the same radiographic density of soft tissue. Now, fat is a little less dense, just as Sabina said. 
you can see on that thigh that the superficial part is the subcutaneous fat, and there's a clear demarcating line between the fat and the skeletal muscle, which is deeper and more radiographically dense. The air... Can I ask a question? Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. Oh, I, I, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but um, where does where does cartilage fall on the spectrum between fat, soft tissue, and bone? Cartilage would show up as soft tissue, so it would be indistinguishable from uh, any other soft tissue. Okay, perfect. Thanks. You're welcome. In, in, in uh, children, we always see a lot of cartilage. For example, Michael, uh, on that femur, the space between the femoral head and the femoral metaphysis is cartilage. The space between the femoral head and the ossified part of the acetabulum is also cartilage. So, uh, a, and then also the intervertebral discs are all cartilage. So th that's all soft tissue density. So jumping to computed tomography CT, this uses the exact same technology as x-ray. We are bombarding a patient with photons of, uh, of the energy associated with x-rays. And a, most of those photons are going to be absorbed by the patient, but a few of them are going to pass through the patient and be available to a detector on the other side of the patient. And depending upon which photons pass through the patient and which are absorbed, the uh, detector can reproduce a picture of, of the object that's in front of it. Not unlike taking your hand and a flashlight and making a shadow picture on the wall where you can uh, see exactly which uh, photons have been blocked and which photons uh, are not absorbed. In CT, because it's the same technology, we have the exact same palette of five different shades of gray, where white represents the most radiodense things and black represents the least radiodense things. The main difference in CT is that instead of five shades that are distinct, they blend in together so we have a whole continuum of different shades of gray, and so we can start to differentiate some of the soft tissues we mentioned. In the picture on the right, we can see that the skeletal muscle along the uh, right lateral abdominal wall is of a distinct density compared to the liver. And the liver is of a slightly distinct density compared to that large soft tissue uh, mass in the left lower quadrant. On the radiograph, we can't tell what that big soft tissue density is. It could be fluid, it could be a tumor. It could be an enlarged organ. It could be a hematoma. All of those things would have the same density. But on the CT, we can see because of its shape and density that that represents the enlarged spleen, which makes sense. Going back to the radiograph, the pattern of skin staples is in sort of a, uh, a uh, peace sign, a little chevron uh, uh, with the vertical extension, which is typical of the skin incision that's used in liver transplantation. So we know this child had a liver transplantation, and so them having an enlarged spleen would not be very surprising. This is one of the quiz questions, which metal is used in x-ray markers? You have probably already answered that uh, previously. Let's, use, let's just see if we can use the chat function here and uh, and uh, just to try it out. Will you just type in your answers? Okay. Thank you. These are uh, four different rooms at Primary Children's Hospital, uh, representing four of the different x-ray studies or imaging studies that you might uh, order as an ordering provider. Uh, we'll go through each one of these and just say a few words about what happens in each of these rooms. This is a x-ray room where the uh, x-ray detector, which is the flat panel with the grid on it, and the x-ray 
generator or x-ray tube, which is the uh, machine in the foreground, are situated about six feet apart. And the technologist positions the patient in front of the detector as close to the detector as possible so that there's the, as little distortion as possible and with as little motion as possible. And then they, uh, they shine a beam of x-rays at the patient and those x-rays that are not absorbed, but rather pass through the patient are detected on the uh, uh, digital detector, uh, that flat panel there. This uses, of course, ionizing radiation. And so, although it's, it's not a significant amount, we always think about ionizing radiation in pediatrics. Uh, every time we do a study, we have to make a calculation of how much dose we are using and what is the potential risk to the patient of subsequent cancer from ionizing radiation. This is an MR scanner. Uh, the main distinction between X-ray and MR is there is no ionizing radiation in MR. This makes 3D images of any body part you choose. The patient sits on the table and is guided into the bore or the hollowed out area in the center of the machine. They stay inside for somewhere between 45 minutes and two hours, depending upon what is being imaged. They usually have something attached to their body called a coil. On the shelves behind the machine, you can see different uh, uh, devices. Those are coils that go on the body. They're like little antennas that receive the radio frequency signal to make it into a picture. This is uh, what happens in an MR uh, machine if MR safety protocols are not followed. The MR is essentially a giant, very strong magnet that is always on, even when uh, patients aren't being imaged, even late at night when there's no technologists around, even when the lights are turned off and you wander down there to see if you can find someone to help you interpret a study. The, the magnet is always on, and it always carries the danger of taking metal objects and violently throwing them into the bore of the magnet. This triangular-shaped structure with the casters on the bottom is a linen cart. And in this event, uh, someone who was cleaning up the room did not follow the safety procedures and got that linen cart too close to the magnet. And because of the powerful strength of the magnet, it was swept up uh, right into the bore there. While I was in training as a radiologist, I remember this story and I looked it up just to share it with you. There's a tragic story of a patient who was in the magnet and someone brought an oxygen canister into the room during the scan. And that oxygen canister, of course, uh, was swept up into the magnet. And unfortunately, there was a patient in there and the oxygen canister struck the patient in the head. The important thing to remember is, as a clinician, when you approach a scanning room, there are warnings uh, about the different levels of MRI safety that's required. Please pay attention to those and do not ever enter a scanning room unless you are specifically directed, unless you ask the MRI technologist for anything on your person that might be damaged or might cause damage in the MRI scanner. This is a CT scanner. It looks a lot like an MR scanner, but the bore of the machine is much less deep. So once you go in it, you're already coming out of it. It's only about 12 inches thick. So a patient's much less likely to get claustrophobia in a CT scanner than in an MR scanner. The MR took 45 minutes to two hours. The CT scanner takes just a very brief amount of time. Although the patient will probably be lying on the table for five, 10, or 15 minutes, to get their IV ready, the actual scanning time is less than a second. So a CT can be taken very quickly. And in the pediatric setting, that's helpful because 
we use sedation much less frequently with CT than we do with MRI. This is a nuclear medicine camera or a gamma camera. This captures the gamma rays that are produced during nuclear medicine exams. Um, let's shift to Sam. Can you turn on your microphone? Yeah, so, go ahead. Thank you. What's the major difference between nuclear medicine imaging and x-ray imaging? So uh, that's coming back to one of your questions, this first one. But I believe we're talking about a nuclear medicine, the patient becomes the source of the radiation. Normally with like an x-ray image, we're kind of shooting those x-rays through them. So the source of radiation is external, the ionizing radiation. And with nuclear, we're implanting or giving them a, a radiating source, and then we're picking up on it externally for the image. That's exactly right. So in nuclear medicine, we administer something to the patient that's called a radiopharmaceutical. That's a specific molecule that is targeted to a specific physiologic process. So if we inject something, we know where in the body it's going to accumulate. To that molecule, we attach a radioactive atom. We usually use a radioactive atom that is readily available, that's inexpensive, that has a relatively short half-life, so the patient is not uh, radioactive for a long period of time, that is excreted uh, by the kidneys, and that is of relatively low energy. So, uh, nuclear medicine also involves ionizing radiation, as Sam said. Uh, the, uh, the amount of radiation that's produced in nuclear medicine exams is sometimes less than in an x-ray, but sometimes it's far more. A PET CT is an example of, an exam of a nuclear medicine examination that uses far more ionizing radiation than an x-ray. Okay, three more rooms in the imaging department of primary children's. This is an ultrasound machine, no ionizing radiation. On the machine there, there are some different uh, devices that are attached by those long white cords. Those are called the probes or the ultrasound cameras. And those probes are put up against the patient's skin and they send out an ultrasound beam and receive the reflected uh, ultrasound waves and they form an image. Uh, the patient doesn't need to be sedated for this. The things can be done in real time. You can see physiologic processes. You, you can see uh, uh, bladder filling and emptying. Uh, you can see hydronephrosis getting worse or better sometimes as the bladder fills and empties. You can see blood flow. So uh, a highly useful modality in pediatrics. No ionizing radiation, relatively cheap. This is an x-ray camera like in the first slide, uh, but this is used to make x-ray movies. The patient lies on the table and the x-ray beam is turned on and we watch something that is happening underneath uh, by x-ray. Usually we do that by administration of a contrast agent that will allow us to look at a specific body part uh, in real time. So this is a fluoroscopy machine, uh, obviously uses ionizing radiation, more ionizing radiation in general than just uh, x-ray. This is a souped up version of the fluoroscopy suite in the previous slide. This is the interventional radiology suite. And here a patient will come in and have a procedure that's done by image guidance. The C-shaped device at the left side of the picture is an x-ray camera. There's another one of those that's just outside the field of view on the left. It's sort of moved aside. But that there's a the other C can be sort of superimposed over the first C, and then you can have biplane fluoroscopy. You can simultaneously look at uh, anatomy in two different orthogonal imaging planes.
Uh, obviously, I, good question. Yes. Um, the source of X-rays is it from the bottom in this picture or from the top? I think on this one, it's from the bottom, but I'm not a hundred percent sure which side the X-rays come out on. Okay. Okay, Sam has already answered this question, which is true about differences between x-ray studies and nuclear medicine scans? A is true. B is false. X-rays do not always deliver lower radiation doses. Uh, C, nuclear medicine does use gamma rays, but they are not non-ionizing. That's in the uh, ionizing part of the uh, spectrum. And bone scans provide greater anatomic detail than x-rays is false. In general, nuclear medicine scans provide less crisp anatomic detail. Okay, imaging cost. This is a picture of the offerings at a restaurant you might have been to just down the hill from the medical school on 9th and 9th. It's called Pago. And they have a wonderful menu with a variety of different things you can buy. If you and I were to go to the restaurant together as some sort of medical school function, and if I had offered to pay for the meal, and if you were handed the menu, which is here, I can predict with near certainty one thing that you would not order on the menu. The New York strip steak. Although it looks amazing, grass-fed Utah beef with a, a number of wonderful fruits and vegetables attached, the, uh, the price of $40 is probably going to be prohibitive. It's more than twice as much as the Pago burger, which only costs $19. And so I could predict that almost it's almost impossible that you would order the New York strip steak as the most expensive thing on the menu. When you are ordering x-ray studies for your patients, it's helpful to know what you're getting your patient into. Because although sometimes the insurance company is the payer, often it's the patient themselves. And cost is a very real consideration. So when you order the x-ray study or any test that is expensive, and unlikely to provide much benefit, the patient will probably make a similar decision about whether they get that study to the decision you made about whether you're going to order the New York strip steak. So uh, let's go to Michael. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So this, it lists the cost of various imaging studies in order. And I just want you to tell us which one is the least costly and which one is the most costly. The least costly would be one and the most costly would be four. Which of these represents them in the proper order? Okay. I know MRI is most costly and, um, you know, I would have actually guessed the ultrasound was cheaper, would have been the cheapest. Um, and... And then I think CT would be behind MRI, but um, out of these choices, I would choose A. Perfect. Thank you. So if you were to represent the relative cost of these studies, uh, you're right. X-ray and CT or X-ray and ultrasound are pretty close, but ultrasound is about twice as expensive as an X-ray. CT is far more expensive than an X-ray. And the MRI on an average of 13 times more expensive than the x-ray can actually be 20 times more expensive than the x-ray depending upon what body parts imaged and whether contrast is administered and which sequences are used. So MRI, as you stated, Michael, is definitely the most expensive of the modalities listed. Okay, let's go back to Sabina. We're shifting gears now and talking about radiation dose, and we're going to do the same exercise, Sabina, with radiation dose as with uh, we just did with cost. So the least radiation dose would be one, and the most radiation dose would be five. Which is the correct order? 
Um, okay, so we know that ultrasound uses acoustic technology, so acoustic waves, which are not uh, radioactive or radiative. Um, so that's easy enough. I think that's followed by MRI because that uses technology um, that excites the hydrogen atoms in the body, and that's not ionizing radiation. So that's easy enough. So that eliminates choice A. So we're between B and C. Um, then we know that X-rays deliver ionizing radiation, and then CT is kind of an X-ray on steroids. So it uh, delivers, you know, a couple times more radiation than that. So that's, um, I don't, I'm not sure where contrast enema would necessarily fit into this because um, I'm not sure if the x-ray is irradiating the entire body or just a portion. CT, also the same thing. Um, let me just... I'm, I'm going to go with B. I may be wrong. I really like the way you worked through that very systematically. And about 95% of your logic was correct. Uh, it, as it turns out, a contrast enema, because you're shining a continuous beam of x-rays at a patient, is going to be more, more dose than an x-ray. So B is not correct because X-ray has less dose than a contrast enema. Now it is true. Okay. It is true that contrast enema and CT can sort of be in the same range, but on average, in an adult at least, a contrast enema will give more, uh, more radiation than a CT. In kids, it's okay, sometimes gotcha. less. Let me show you how that turns out in terms of uh, proportion here. So as you pointed out, Sabina. Ultrasound and MRI both have zero uh, ionizing radiation. X-ray, we'll just call that one unit of radiation. And CT is between 10 and 70 times as much as an X-ray. And contrast enema has sort of a big range. In pediatrics, we can sometimes do enemas with very little radiation, meaning only about six times as much as an X-ray. But it can be up to 80 times as much uh, as an x-ray and the source for that information is listed at the bottom of the slide. Let's talk about radiation dose in terms of something your patient will understand. If you start talking about sieverts, millisieverts, rentgens, rays, rads, it's hard even for me to remember what those units exactly mean and what is the conversion factor between all those units because they're not really units that are used in everyday life very much. But what your patients can understand is that all of us are exposed to radiation as part of our general living on the planet Earth. Most of that comes from a terrestrial sources, principally radon. So when you go to buy a home, you always make sure that someone has tested for radon that is, is your home disadvantageously placed in a part of the earth where radon happens to be emanating into the basement of the house? And does the basement have poor enough ventilation that it accumulates over time? That's the purpose of a radon test. So the, the, there are natural terrestrial sources of radiation like radon. Then there's uh, radiation that we consume. Uh, because it's in the plants and vegetables we eat. There's cosmic radiation coming from the sun. There's other sources of terrestrial radiation, and then there's medical radiation. So if you were to talk to your patient about radiation, sometimes it's just helpful to assume living for one day at sea level, we, we all would receive a baseline level of radiation. That would be a unit that you could use to say, if you were living at sea level for one day, all of these natural sources of radiation would result in that one day unit of radiation. And then you can compare medical imaging studies to that unit and so the patient can see how much more radiation they're getting than they would just by existing. So in a three hour flight, 
because you're much closer to the sun and the cosmic radiation is higher, gives you that much radiation. A chest X-ray gives you that much radiation and so on for CT, contrast enema. And then here's the one we talked about briefly earlier, a PET scan. So you can accumulate a lot of radiation in medical imaging. All right, let's spend the rest of the time talking about some cases. Here's a, a one-year-old, uh, sorry, seven-year-old with suspected constipation. Why don't we go back to Sam? Can you turn on your microphone, please? Yeah. Sam, using what we talked about with x-ray densities, what do you notice about this study? Um, we're seeing some... I don't know. It's not necessarily an air level, but we're seeing some pockets of what I would consider air with that hypodensity. Yes. And there's... Um, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead, please. I'm just trying to think back to other cases or pictures I've seen of, of abdominal radiographs. Um, and the fact that we have a history of constipation, it looks like there's a lot of like backed up in his intestines. Like that could be... Um, BC's there on his right side as well. That's probably like mixed in with air that I'm seeing. The word that we sometimes use for this is modeled. There are modeled lucencies, meaning these tiny, irregularly shaped lucencies scattered throughout the soft tissue density in a pattern that follows the expected course of the colon. So you can see that pattern of these little flecks of lucency starting in the right lower quadrant where you'd expect the cecum to be and following all through the ascending colon, transverse colon, way up there into the left upper quadrant, all along the descending colon. And then in the pelvis, the rectum is actually distended and widened with these little flecks of lucency. So that's all stool, way more stool than is normal. So we can confirm this patient has a large stool burden. And if the clinical symptoms of constipation are there, he might need some medical help. The patient comes into the hospital. He has a tube put down uh, his nose and some sort of uh, cleansing solution is run through his tube. He probably also has some enemas administered. And over the course of one or two days, he undergoes what they call a clean out. So Sam, using the follow-up radiograph on the right, uh, why don't you tell us what's different about the follow-up radiograph compared to the previous? Um, so we don't have that modeling effect anymore. We're, we're seeing he was able to move his stool through the decompaction or whatever enemas and um, tubes that helped him. Um, but we're still seeing uh, what would I, I would expect be physiologic air in normal intestine space. Um, yeah, it just looks like a healthy abdominal radiograph at this point to me. Perfect. So the transverse colon, which previously had this modeled density superimposed on soft tissue density, which is the classic finding for stool, now just has air in it. So he's pretty much totally cleaned out. So our diagnosis here was constipation with successful treatment. It cost us two x-rays to do it. And our dose was two units of radiation. Remember, each of those units is about 10 days of naturally occurring radiation. So this child, after he left, in addition to having much less stool, is 20 days older in terms of radiation dose than he was when he started. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, Sabina. Can you take one of these, please? Using what we talked sure. about with uh, radiographic densities, can you evaluate this radiograph, please? Um, okay, so we are not seeing that modeling effect here to the same extent that we did uh, with the previous uh, seven-year-old with the constipation. Um, but I don't believe this is normal to be seeing this much hyperdense material in the abdominal area. So it's a little bit too um, white or hyper dense in this case. Um, there's also an area like a circular kind of an oblong area of less density in the center of the abdomen, kind of just above 
uh, the colon that is filled with air. That's actually um, the key to the case. And you described it perfectly. An oblong or circular area of less density. Can you make some assumptions about what you're seeing there? Uh, so it's uh, denser than air, but it's um, less dense than the surrounding soft tissue. So it could be, um, it's a little round. So it could be fluid of some sort, um, possibly blood. Am I on the right track here? You, I, I really love the way you identify the abnormality perfectly. Let me just clarify something that I should have clarified before. Just like Cezanne mixed his five or mixed his many colors together, in radiographs, those five densities that we talked about are not always represented as an isolated density. In other words, um, the air that's in the bowel is of varying densities because there is other tissue superimposed over the air. And so the x-ray beam that's going through that air in the bowel has to pass through the body wall, the soft tissue of the body wall, the bowel wall, some skeletal muscle in the posterior part of the abdomen, and sometimes through a solid organ. So the beam will be attenuated a little bit, so it won't be quite as black on the x-ray as the air surrounding the patient. So Okay. So we've got a round air bubble um, in the abdomen. Perfect. Um, Perfect. So the, as you look at that lucency there, even though it's not as lucent as the, the, the air in the lung or the air in the bowel, it's still air because it's more lucent than all of the other densities on there. And because the only other reasonable choice would be fat. And it's very unlikely that you're going to have a big circular blob of fat in the uh, in in the abdomen. Instead, what you're worried about here is that you have a round collection of air, and the only way you would have that is if air had escaped the normal uh, anatomic boundaries of the bowel and escaped into the peritoneal cavity in general. In order to prove this to yourself, you could take an x-ray uh, that's taken with a slightly different perspective. That's the abnormality that Sabina pointed out. Excellent job. This is the kind of x-ray you might want to order. This is called a cross-table lateral radiograph. That's where the patient is supine. The x-ray beam is a horizontal beam, meaning the x-rays are in a horizontal plane as they course through the patient. The advantage of a horizontal beam radiograph is that you get a fluid level. So you can see the x-ray beam going right across the surface of that air fluid collection. In the anterior abdomen on this radiograph, you see that same oval collection of air. You see the liver, a soft tissue density, peeking out like an iceberg from the fluid that's also in the bowel, or in the peritoneal cavity. And just below the liver, you see a little loop of bowel, and you can see the bowel wall also sticking out, floating in that uh, air fluid cavity in the peritoneal cavity. It's always abnormal to have air in the peritoneal cavity, and it usually means that there has been a rupture of the bowel. So this is a surgical emergency when you see free air. And we used a cross-table lateral radiograph to confirm the findings that Sabina made on the supine radiograph. So we diagnosed bowel perforation. It took us two x-rays, and our dose was two units of radiation, so 20 days more of naturally occurring radiation. This is a similar case where there is an abnormal lucency, but it's not a round ball or an oval. It's a, what they call a cupola, meaning a dome shape. And if you look at the top of the image, just where you'd expect the diaphragm to be, there's a very lucent crescent of air that has a sharp interface along its superior margin. 
the sharp interface is between air density below and soft tissue density above. That's the cupola sign. On the bottom of the cupola sign, it sort of gradually goes from air density into soft tissue density. So this is the region we're talking about. That's the cupola. And again, when we see that, we're worried about free air, and we go to some sort of horizontal beam radiograph. This one is different than the prior one. This one is called a left lateral decubitus abdomen, where the patient is laying on the left side. And again, a horizontal beam of x-rays is used. And the advantage of that is we can see the air uh, in an anti-dependent position and the fluid uh, would go to a dependent position. The reason we use left lateral decubitus is because the liver gives such a nice soft tissue contrast next to that air. If you use right lateral decubitus, then you have the stomach in the, the left upper quadrant, and uh, the stomach is full of air, and so it can be more confusing to look for free air. Which are both examples of horizontal beam radiographs? Well, supine is not. In supine, the X-ray is shine is uh, in a vertical plane, but right lateral decubitus is. Cross table lateral is, but KUB isn't. KUB means kidneys, ureters, bladder. That's an old school way of just saying I want a single shot, including the kidneys, ureters, and bladder. Typically, that's taken in a supine position. Upright is a form of horizontal radiograph. That's like when we showed the x-ray room and the patient would be standing and the x-ray would be in a horizontal plane going from the uh, x-ray tube to the detector. So upright is a horizontal beam. Cross table lateral is a horizontal beam. C is the right answer. On D, the word lateral abdomen you can put that on an order, I want a lateral abdomen, but it's confusing. Do you mean I want the patient to lay down on the x-ray table and just to roll up on their side and you to shoot the x-ray beam while they're, while they're on their side? That would be a lateral abdomen. Or do you mean I want the patient to be standing and turn to the side and shoot the x-ray? Or do you mean lateral decubitus abdomen? So lateral abdomen is not really a, a very precise way of ordering a study. Uh, but the second choice there, right lateral decubitus, is an example of a horizontal beam radiograph. Let's do this one more case. This is a newborn with a distended abdomen. When you have uh, uh, air density in multiple bowel loops like we do here, uh, the concern is that there is an obstruction of the bowel. And if there's lots of loops involved, the concern is that it's a, a distal bowel obstruction. That is that somewhere uh, distal to the small bowel or in the very end of the small bowel, there is an obstruction. The uh, study of choice to diagnose that is a contrast enema because you want to take a look at the structure of the colon and see if it is causing an obstruction. This is a fluoroscopic image. So this is obtained in that fluoroscopy room where you give x-ray contrast. For some reason, uh, historically and currently, fluoroscopy images are often reversed in their grayscale. So when you look at them, everything you expect to be black is actually white, and everything you expect to be white is actually black. So that x-ray contrast that's been put into the colon is very radiodense. And if it, we were taking an x-ray of it, it would be white. But the fluoroscopic grayscale reversed image shows it as black. This image shows that the colon is small in caliber, a microcolon. It shows that the contrast makes its way through a colon that's normal in position but abnormal in caliber. And the cecum is writing a little bit high in the right upper quadrant. You can see that the appendix is partially filled with contrast, that little loop of contrast below the cecum. And then the ilium is the tube going centrally from the cecum that ends in a sharp point. This is an example of ileal atresia, where the 
bowel was formed, but due to some sort of vascular accident in utero, uh, the a segment of the bowel dies and turns into a fibrous cord. So this baby has a bowel obstruction based on ileal atresia. Here we spent an x-ray, we spent a little bit more on the enema, and in terms of our dose, we spent one unit on the x-ray, and because it's a pediatric patient, and we require fairly low doses of x-ray during the enema, we only gave seven times as much for this enema. Again, for an adult patient, this could be up to 80 times as much as an x-ray. So our total dose was eight units of radiation or 80 days of naturally occurring radiation. Okay, I think we'll end this lecture there and uh, maybe take five minutes before we move on to the next one. Okay, let's start the next lecture. This one is called Pediatric Radiology is the Best Medical Specialty. I hope that doesn't offend you in case you didn't choose pediatric radiology, but I think it's possible that you haven't chosen your specialty yet. Maybe Sabina especially hasn't made that decision yet. And I just want to put in the case that for me, pediatric radiology is the best medical specialty. I had a long course to pediatric radiology. Uh, I started out as a pediatrician, so I did a pediatric residency for three years. And somewhere along the way, I figured out that the specialty of pediatrics I enjoyed most was pediatric radiology. Unfortunately, there's not really a direct path from general pediatrics to pediatric radiology. So I had to sort of start over and do a pediatrics uh, or a radiology residency. But where I have landed finally after a lot of years of training is a place that I find to be very stimulating and uh, it really fulfills everything I hoped would happen with regard to my career in medicine. Okay, uh, let me just check in with those who are online. Can you just give me a yes on the chat if you can hear me and if we're all, all seem to be working? Excellent, thank you. So uh, one thing that's cool about pediatric radiology is pediatric radiologists interpret imaging from early gestation through early adulthood. Here's a patient uh, that was evaluated by pediatric radiology. Fetal MRI is a part of this field. And this is the patient where there's a twin gestation. And unlike most twins, these twins are sharing some important anatomy. Instead of being distinct physical bodies, these twins come together in the midline. And in the region of the chest and upper abdomen, there's a sharing of vital structures. This is the heart chambers, and down below is the liver, and those two things are both not unique to either of the twins, but shared between them. You can see how that would be a problem. After these twins were born, they underwent CTA. CT is a great way to look at vascular structures. There's a lot of spatial resolution, especially when you give iodine contrast. So all of the vessels on this picture are very dense because they've been lit up, so to speak, by injecting iodine contrast. And you can see in the upper center of the image, some cardiac chambers, none of them look exactly normal. And the main problem is they're all jumbled together. So the patient on the right of the image has more heart chambers and the patient on the left of the image has fewer heart chambers, but they're all commonly shared. In contrast, the patient on the left has more liver and the patient on the right has less 
liver, but it's all one common organ. You can imagine how difficult that would be to sort out how to give uh, functional organs to each twin. This is a, another uh, rendition of the CTA just from the axial plane showing that cardiac chambers and the mutual sharing of dysplastic cardiac chambers. And then this is another processed image from the CTA. Because CT results in such different densities, especially when you use contrast, you can ask the computer to ignore certain densities and to highlight other densities. So here, really just the vessels and the organs that receive a lot of blood flow are highlighted. The vessels show up in that sort of off-white color and the organs like the kidneys on the right hand side and the liver in the center of the screen show up as sort of that red color. What are the primary and secondary modalities for evaluating fetal anomalies? Well, almost all uh, babies get an ultrasound, so ultrasound is the primary modality for screening, and MRI is the follow-up modality. CT is sometimes used, not at our institution, but there are institutions that use CT in the prenatal setting to look at uh, skeletal anomalies, and they use it in very low doses in cases where they feel like the diagnosis of the skeletal anomaly warrants the use of ionizing radiation to the fetus. They only use it in the second and third trimester, not in the first trimester. Uh, another cool thing about pediatric radiology is that pediatric radi radiologists diagnose and treat vascular anomalies. This is a patient with a number of different problems. One of the problems is a limb length discrepancy. And in pediatrics, we see a lot of patients with limb length discrepancy. In this case, it's a problem of uh, hemihypertrophy or limb overgrowth. You can see how much longer the patient's left femur is compared to their right femur. Similarly, their left tibia is longer than their right tibia. She underwent uh, epiphysiodesis, which means a surgical closure of the epiphyses of the long bones. So by stapling across the uh, physis, uh, future growth of that bone is prevented and it allows the shorter bone to catch up. So after the epiphysiodesis, uh, you can see that the knee joint sort of more closely approximates the height uh, of the overgrown left side. Hemihypertrophy is just one of this girl's uh, medical problems. The other issue is she had something wrong with her blood vessels. This is an MRI exam of the lower extremities. And let's start with Michael. I just wanted to ask you a question. This shows, Michael, the, uh, the aorta, the common iliac arteries in the bright white at the top of the image. The, uh, the right leg looks pretty normal. The left leg has a diffusely enlarged uh, arterial system. And then you also see in a slightly uh, lower shade of gray, uh, the venous system on the, the left side. So my question to you, Michael, is where is the right common femoral vein? Why don't we see that on this image? Um, I feel like if I look at the right side towards the uh, I guess that's a, I see a right common iliac, I think. Um, and then it just seems to disappear as it goes down into the leg or gets really thin behind the artery. Yeah, the, um, the this is an MRA, so this is a dynamic exam. So it sort of follows the contrast going through the patient. and. The key here is that because that left side arterial system is so overgrown and because there are abnormal con connections between the arteries and the veins on the left side, the left-sided veins fill up much more quickly in time than the right-sided veins. The reason we don't see the right-sided veins as well is because of the timing of this exam. Uh, 
This is done in the arterial phase when the arteries are lit up. And it's abnormal for all those veins to be lit up. All those left-sided veins you see and the IVC at the very top of the image next to the aorta, that's all abnormal. You should not see those veins in the picture, just as you don't see the veins on the right side very well. So the problem is not in the right sided veins. The problem is in the left sided veins. And the reason you see them is they are abnormally connected to the left sided arteries without a normal capillary bed in between them. This is called an arterial venous malformation, where you have direct communication between the arteries and the veins. The uh, little blobs that you see are aneurysms that form because of the high flow through these abnormal arterial venous connections. And in the interventional radiology suite that we showed in the last lecture, a pediatric radiologist might thread a catheter into the arterial system and go into that abnormal connection called the nidus between the arteries and the veins and ablate that with ethanol in an effort to treat this malformation. In general, when you're talking about vascular anomalies, there's an enormous breadth of things you could be referring to. An aortic coarctation or a narrowing of the aorta is a vascular anomaly. A duplicated renal artery or two arteries to the same kidney instead of just one is a vascular anomaly. A capillary malformation sometimes called a port wine stain, or that red or purplish flat discoloration of skin someone might have, is an example of a vascular anomaly. All of these are under the general category of vascular anomalies, and if you try to separate them, people historically have tried many different ways to try to understand them and categorize them, but the current system that helps us to break these down into understandable parts uses two categories, tumors and malformations. A tumor is a vascular anomaly that also includes a soft tissue mass. A malformation just involves the vessel itself. So the thing we just saw was a malformation because there's no soft tissue mass. It's just arteries, an abnormal connection, the nidus, and the veins. The entire vascular anomaly consists of abnormal vessels. If you wanted to classify them further under tumors, you could have things that are benign, like a hemangioma, things that are borderline, like a hemangioendothelioma, or things that are malignant, like an angiosarcoma. Under malformations, you can have things that are simple malformations, like a capillary malformation, a venous malformation, or what we just saw, an arterial venous malformation. You can have combined things, like some children have a combined venous malformation and lymphatic malformation, or venous malformation with capillary malformation, or you can have things that are syndromic, like the first patient we saw, where there's hemihypertrophy in addition to uh, vascular malformation. This is an example of a baby who's born with a vascular anomaly. On the left, there's an MRI of the liver showing round T2 hyperintense masses throughout the liver. On the right is an MRA showing the aorta in arterial phase and also the hepatic veins lighting up in the same phase. This demonstrates the same phenomenon we saw on a prior slide where there is arterial venous shunting uh, through these small tumors in the liver. Many times, a hemangioma of the infantile type is a benign condition that just shows up as a small reddish mass, often on the head or neck of an infant. These things can usually be followed conservatively, and after a brief period of growth, they resolve spontaneously over the next one to two years. This patient has numerous infantile hemangiomas, and because of the arterial venous shunting, they have 
heart failure as a result. So this is an infantile hemangioma. Because there is a soft tissue mass, we classify this vascular anomaly as a tumor. This is of the benign type. Here's a, uh, an arterial venous malformation. I know you saw one of these in a prior lecture. This one is in the cerebellum. And the thing to notice is that on the left, because of the arterial venous shunting, you have early filling of the draining veins of the uh, of the dura, the dural venous sinuses, and the left internal jugular vein fills up early. This is an angiographic video of the same thing. By injecting the right vertebral artery, the basilar artery fills up, the posterior cerebral artery, and then that vast tangle of vessels in the left uh, cerebellar hemisphere, that arterial venous malformation. And the thing to notice here is that the left dural venous sinuses fill up very early. Already you see the transverse sigmoid sinuses on the left, whereas you don't see the sinuses on the right. This is just like the picture we saw earlier of a leg, where we saw left-sided veins, but we didn't see right-sided veins. Like on the leg, here, it's the left-sided veins that are abnormal because of this AVM. The right-sided veins are normal, and they shouldn't show up until much later in the, uh, in the progression. So here you see the right-sided dural venous sinuses showing up as they normally should after the blood goes through the capillary bed. What are the two basic categories of vascular anomalies? Well. People talk about high flow and low flow. These, these lesions that I showed you are all high flow lesions. People talk about benign and malignant. People talk about arterial and venous. But in terms of the very basic categorization, the two things to first split them apart, the very first thing to learn about vascular anomaly is you have tumors and you have malformations. Tumors involve a soft tissue mass. Malformations just involve abnormal vessels. Okay, the third cool thing about uh, pediatric radiology is pediatric radiologists rely on a foundation in anatomy. Um, Sam, I'm going to play this video and maybe I'll have you turn on your microphone and make some observations about it. Would that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a five-year-old with abdominal pain and groin swelling. I'm going to play the video here. So if I take, whoops, if I take the video here, Sam, and I stop it, I'm not super good with these controls. If I stop it, Sam, right sort of here, can you make some observations about what you see on that picture? Yeah, so it looks like we're seeing an abnormality on the right side. This is like an in groin area or inguinal area. Um, we're seeing this mass on the anterior side of what looks to be some some muscular bodies. Um, I'm trying to just think of how to describe also the density. It looks isodense to some of the surrounding soft tissue but also some um, some hypodensity more centrally in this area. Excellent. What would you, if you chose this density, what would it be similar to that's also on the picture? Um, it would be similar to the central area of this picture, um, this bladder. Right. Is that the bladder? Yeah. That's the bladder. 
So with CT, especially when we use IV contrast, we can differentiate different densities better than we can on radiographs. Even though fat density out here and soft tissue density are very different, we can start to differentiate between the central inner component here that's fluid density, same as bladder, and the rind outside it that's soft tissue density out here. That we can't do that with radiographs, only with CT. So you described it beautifully. We have a process in the inguinal region or groin that actually extends right all the way down into the right hemiscrotum. And its features are pretty uniform. It's got central hypodensity or fluid density and peripheral uh, soft tissue density. If we scroll back up and say, is there anything else going on, we can see a similar process in the right lower quadrant. This irregular structure with soft tissue density peripherally and fluid density centrally also has a little drop of what kind of density is that, Sam? That would be air. So there's a little air in that cavity. So if you had an air fluid collection, irregular, in the right lower quadrant that actually even extended up here in the right pericolic gutter, in a five-year-old with abdominal pain, what process do you think might be happening? Uh, I'd be suspicious for like a herniation into that um, scrotum that you mentioned earlier. I think that's exactly what's happening and what's herniating is actually an inflammatory process. Children with right lower quadrant pain are always suspected of having appendicitis. And when they are boys with right lower quadrant pain, they are more likely to have appendicitis than a girl with right lower quadrant pain just because there's less complicated anatomy. There's really not much going on in the right lower quadrant. So if you have a five-year-old who presents to the ER, with compelling signs and symptoms of appendicitis, you're going to be right a lot of the time. When you get a CT exam and you see this air fluid collection, which is an abscess in the right lower quadrant, there's really only two things to think of, appendicitis or inflammatory bowel disease. Other things would be very rare. The interesting thing about this case is this concept of a hernia. You mentioned that something is herniating. Well, most kids who have appendicitis just have involvement of the peritoneal cavity. This child has extension right here through a very narrow neck into the inguinal region. And as you mentioned, that's the inguinal canal. So, Sam, how does an abscess get from the scrotum to the peritoneal cavity or maybe vice versa, from the peritoneal cavity to the scrotum. How do you explain that? Um, so through, and trying to remember the right terminology. So we're talking about the inguinal canal and herniations can come from that peritoneal cavity through the inguinal canal. And that would be an indirect uh, herniation into the scrotum. All right. Well, we, we get to talk about that exactly on the next slide. So we are talking about an inguinal hernia. We're talking about a patent communication between the peritoneal cavity and the uh, scrotum. And the next slide sort of details what's going on. So all of the different layers of the abdominal wall, the skin, the external oblique muscle, the internal oblique muscle, the transversus abdominis, all of that continues down into the scrotum as an outpouching of the body. Similarly, the peritoneal cavity sends a little uh, herniation, a thin, narrow extension called the processus vaginalis. On this diagram, it's termed the vaginal process. The processus vaginalis is this uh, herniation of peritoneal lining that normally occurs as a patient is developing. The testis 
which is a retroperitoneal structure behind the peritoneal cavity, descends, guided by the gubernaculum, the little blue cord, till it finds its way all the way down into the scrotum. During this time, it remains a retroperitoneal structure, but it is surrounded by this tunica vaginalis, which is the remnant of the processus vaginalis. As a baby is formed, the, the processus vaginalis is supposed to close off. That connection between the peritoneum and the scrotum is supposed to obliterate and form two different little uh, peritoneal line structures, the peritoneal cavity above and the tunica vaginalis below. They're not supposed to communicate. But in the patient that we saw on the previous slide, there was an abnormal, persistent processus vaginalis that allowed that abscess that was in the peritoneal cavity to slide right down into the scrotum. So this is the patient we just saw where there's an abscess in the right lower quadrant that goes through the inguinal canal and uh, into the, into the uh, scrotum. This is a different patient with different pathology also related to uh, the inguinal canal. This is an ultrasound. On ultrasound, uh, by convention, the patient's head is on the left side of the image and the patient's feet are on the right side of uh, the image. This is the structures of the inguinal canal. If we stop it right here, we see the spermatic cord coming in here. We see something that's black on ultrasound that's fluid. And then down here, we see the testis and the uh, epididymis, also surrounded by fluid. This patient has an abnormality where the process of vaginalis didn't close off all the way. Instead, it sort of pinched off a cavity along the spermatic cord. So now you have a peritoneal cavity, which is up here. You have this cyst, which has been pinched off above and below. And then you have uh, the uh, tunica vaginalis, which is also full of fluid, and that's called a hydrocele. This middle compartment is called an insisted hydrocele. So it's a separate, uh, a separate comp compartment from either the peritoneal cavity or the tunica vaginalis. This is an insisted hydrocele of the cord. Here's another patient with a abnormality of the inguinal canal. The first thing you have to know about this patient is they have cystic fibrosis. And the second thing you have to know is that a common neonatal presentation of cystic fibrosis is meconium ileus. That's where the patient has a bowel obstruction due to thick meconium in their distal ileum. <coughs> Excuse me. This patient also experienced uh, a bowel perforation in utero. And when the bowel perforated, the meconium that leaked out into the peritoneal cavity caused a inflammatory reaction. Uh, on the radiograph, just beneath the diaphragm, you see some abnormal linear density that is not soft tissue density, it's uh, calcium density, the same density as bone. You can see it very clearly on the lateral radiograph, that little arc of uh, whiteness just at the level of the diaphragm and just below the sternum. That is peritone that's meconium in the peritoneal cavity that has caused an inflammatory reaction. This finding is called meconium peritonitis. And this signifies that this baby in utero had a perforation resulting in staining of the peritoneal cavity. Oftentimes when a baby's born, the perforation has spontaneously resolved and uh, the only marker that's left is these calcifications and there's no treatment for it. This baby was different, obviously. This baby has cystic fibrosis, so the meconium ileus would have to be treated. <clears throat> 
this patient later in life showed up to the emergency department to have a scrotal ultrasound because of scrotal swelling. This is a transverse view of the scrotum and on both sides, uh, particularly on the patient's left side or the right side of the image, you see a testis, which is the gray round thing. You see a hydrocele, which is the dark gray crescent shape so partially surrounding the testis. And then you see three white echogenic little pearls uh, sort of at the perimeter of that hydrocele. Those echogenic pearls are calcium, and calcium is always abnormal in the testis. It always means that something pathologic is happening. In this uh, case, the calcium got there in the same way that the calcium got into the space just below the diaphragm. This is meconium peritonitis that leaked into the scrotum uh, through a patent processus vaginalis. Finally, here's a case of an inguinal hernia in a female. This is an ultrasound, and if we slow that down, we can see uh, sort of at the top of the image, this is the urinary bladder, this is the rectus muscle. So this is a transverse view with the patient's right over here and the patient's left over on the uh, other side. So the left inguinal region is right there. and you can see coming from next to the bladder, there's that, that sort of medium gray soft tissue structure that extends from inside the peritoneal cavity to outside the peritoneal cavity. And then when it gets down into the groin, it's a rounded mass with some little small fluid sacs called follicles. That's an ovary that has herniated into the inguinal canal in a female patient. So, of all the things that you could find in the inguinal canal, an ovary is pathologic. Calcified meconium in a male is pathologic. A process of vaginalis is pathologic. That's what allows hernias of various types to form. But a gubernaculum remnant in a female is not pathologic. That's called the round ligament of the uterus. And the, the gubernaculum is a normal structure that helps to, to helps to guide the descent of the gonad. In the male, the gubernaculum becomes very short as it guides the testis all the way into the scrotum. In the female, the gubernaculum remnant uh, is longer and it becomes a fibrous cord called the round ligament of the uterus. Okay, pediatric radiologists rely on a foundation in embryology. So if you enjoyed your embryology course, you might enjoy being a pediatric radiologist. Let's go to Sam. Oh, actually, I think I just had Sam turn on. Sab Sabina, can we have you get back on, please? And can you just make some observations about this abdominal radiograph, please? Is this what is commonly referred to as the double bubble sign that we're seeing here? That is exactly what we're seeing here. What do you know about the double bubble sign? Um, so it's a characteristic of some kind of um, like an atresia or volvulus situation happening um, in utero. I don't remember which one exactly. I haven't reviewed embryology for step yet. Um, so it's kind of a, probably a volvulus because why else would you have two bubble signs? Let's just take one step back, Sabina. Everything you've said is, is, uh, is great, thank you. Can you just describe the abnormality in case uh, someone has never heard of the double bubble, what exactly are you seeing? And just talk about it in terms of radiographic densities. Okay, so we're seeing um, a density that's closer to air um, in the middle of the radiograph, and it's kind of oblong. Then we see kind of 
sort of like uh, like an isthmus type of structure and an adjacent uh, round uh, structure kind of also similar to air. So you think that there's the, there are two bubbles, they're sort of connected by a little neck-like structure. Perfect. Two bubbles of air in the uh, abdomen or the okay. double bubble. The first bubble is normal, that's the stomach. And if you were to see that same oblong uh, air density in any stomach, then you would not be alarmed. But the second density, the one that overlies the lower margin of the liver, is abnormal. That's a dilated proximal duodenum. And a double bubble sign is a classic imaging finding for duodenal atresia. That's where the uh, duodenum, which as it's as it's forming, uh, has this epithelial plug that forms. As the epithelium is proliferating in the gut tube, it obliterates the lumen of the duodenum. And if that epithelial plug fails to recanalize, you wind up with an obstruction. Here's a patient who has a very unusual finding on the radiograph. There's a thin, lucent line entirely surrounding the stomach. That's air in the wall of the stomach. That's called pneumatosis of the stomach or gastric pneumatosis. This is a very unusual finding. There's also abnormal air density surrounding the stomach in between the stomach, in between the lesser curvature of the stomach and the lower margin of the liver. Uh, there's a tiny little lucency along the right abdomen in between the liver and the abdominal wall. These suggest free air. This patient was taken to surgery and quote unquote, nothing was found at surgery apart from the gastric pneumatosis. So after surgery, the patient had a upper GI study to sort out why the stomach was so dilated. Here's the upper GI where contrast was administered into the stomach and followed to see where it went. The images are reversed in their grayscale, just like all fluoroscopic images. So the things that are normally white on an x-ray are black on these images. And what you see over time, as this contrast is given first through the, through the uh, tube into the stomach, is that the proximal duodenum is dilated and it doesn't want to move the contrast any further. At one point, there's a little beak on the contrast. In fact, it sort of looks like a duck, although that's not a radiographic sign. It's just serendipitous for this one particular case. But the beak of contrast on the end where the contrast is trying to leave the stomach into the duodenum uh, and the, the dilated duodenum into the next part of the duodenum is the duodenal uh, or is the abnormality on this patient. So like the patient that uh, Sabina discussed, this patient has a proximal bowel obstruction. They might have presented with bilious emesis, which is a common uh, uh, clinical finding in proximal bowel obstruction. They have a dilated duodenum, just like the patient uh, that uh, Sabina described with duodenal atresia. But in this case, the cause is not duodenal atresia, but something else. <clears throat> when the patient was reoperated, they discovered annular pancreas, which is an abnormality in the formation of the pancreas. In general, you're supposed to have a ventral and a dorsal pancreatic bud. And as the duodenum, which is represented by the tan tubular structure in, these, in this graphic, as the duodenum rotates, the ventral pancreatic bud is supposed to wrap around the back of the duodenum and join the dorsal pancreatic bud into one single body. When those buds do not join together, you have abnormalities such as pancreas, pancreas divisum, where you have two different pancreatic ducts. Or if part of that ventral pancreatic bud happens to go around the front of the duodenum, you wind up with an annular pancreas, a pancreas that encircles the duodenum and can cause an obstruction. Here's another child with uh, 
uh, a suspected obstruction. In this case, there are multiple dilated loops of bowel. When a patient has multiple dilated loops of bowel, that's often a sign of distal bowel obstruction. And so an enema was performed. Uh, again, the radiographic densities scale is reversed because it's a fluoroscopy image. Both of these are. And uh, contrast is given into the rectum. Uh, the rectum is, and, and the entire colon is of small caliber, so there's a microcolon. And what other abnormality besides uh, microcolon? Michael, can you turn on your microphone and tell me? Hmm. Maybe in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen, there is a hyper. Dense, well, I guess it would be a hypo density, but I see a darker area in the left lower abdomen. Um, not sure if that's an abnormal finding or not. I, I wonder if you're seeing the femur superimposed on this baby who's sort of wiggly. Yeah, okay, I gotcha. That's, I think that's the soft tissues of the thigh surrounding the femur, and the femur sort of foreshortened because it's sort of coming straight at you. And mm -hmm. that's the problem with wiggly babies, they don't always cooperate. But, gotcha. but in well, terms of the colon itself, just we, we saw on our last lecture a colon in a patient who had ileal latresia, and we followed the course of the colon as it went from rectum, sigmoid, descending colon, transverse colon, cecum. As you follow mm -hmm. this colon in its course, what is unusual about the position of the colon? Oh, yeah, it's it. It def definitely doesn't follow the normal course that a colon should follow. In what way? Um, it goes, I see like a sigmoid colon, and then it goes to the right side instead of the left side of the body. Um, and then I don't see a transverse colon area, so it's it's almost like it's flipped to the opposite side of the body. Exactly. The entire colon is right-sided. That's abnormal, and that makes you think that the patient might have something called malrotation. This is an upper GI that was performed after the enema. So now contrast is being administered from above. The patient is sort of turned to one side, and the stomach has some contrast in it. But the contrast that's leaving the stomach goes into the duodenum, which assumes a corkscrew appearance and is very narrow. And then the contrast just sort of stops. In this case, the duodenum is not dilated. So unlike the duodenal atresia patient we saw first, or the patient with annular pancreas who we saw second, there is no dilated duodenum. That's because this obstruction is not a longstanding obstruction. The malrotation is longstanding. That happened in utero as the patient was forming. But the malrotation happens in the acute setting, and the patient becomes very ill, and, uh, and, and they manifest with symptoms of uh, usually hypotension. And, and so as we, even though we see a proximal bowel obstruction, we don't see a dilated duodenum that you would see in a long-standing process. So that's malrotation with volvulus. Uh, just one final uh, question, Michael. Why did they start with the contrast enema if this was a proximal obstruction? Um, probably because they just saw so many dilated loops of bowel on the x-ray. That is exactly right. The main symptom of a distal bowel obstruction is failure to pass stools or dilated, multiple dilated loops of bowel on the x-ray. Typically, those patients are not as sick as patients with malrotation with volvulus. So in this case, it must have been that the patient was not sick enough to assume they had malrotation. 
but the radiograph was abnormal. So they went to contrast enema first. And when they saw the abnormality on the contrast enema, they proceeded to upper GI to confirm malrotation with volvulus. So the symptoms of proximal obstruction is, is bilious emesis. The symptom of distal obstruction is failure to pass stools and multiple dilated loops on the radiograph. An important exception to that is this case. Malrotation with volvulus is one of the proximal types of obstruction that can present radiographically like a distal obstruction. This shows the normal rotation of the bowel where the bowel herniates out uh, of the abdomen and then slowly undergoes this rotational process as it then withdraws back into the abdominal cavity, achieving the normal configuration of the small bowel starting in the left upper quadrant and coursing to the right lower quadrant and the colon, assuming that course, uh, that typical course from the left lower quadrant to left upper quadrant to right upper quadrant to right lower quadrant. So three different uh, examples of proximal uh, small bowel obstruction, duodenal atresia, annular pancreas, malrotation with volvulus. The malrotation doesn't cause the obstruction. It's the volvulus that causes the obstruction. The volvulus can happen at any time during life. So which of the following is least likely to present with a dilated duodenum? All of those are types of proximal bowel obstruction. The one that's least likely to present with the dilated duodenum is malrotation with volvulus for the reasons we described. Another cool thing about pediatric radiology is pediatric radiologists differentiate between similar appearing diseases of the same organ system. Here's a child who presented to the emergency department with respiratory distress. It looks like they have interstitial opacity, but they also have something very unique for a pediatric patient. They have circumscribed, discrete, rounded lucencies throughout the lungs. This suggests that there are discrete little cavities of air in the lungs or a cavitary process of the lungs. This is a very unusual process for a, an infant. And so the patient went to CT scan. And the CT confirms that there are numerous round, small lucencies throughout both lungs, in addition to some small, round, soft tissue densities in both lungs. This patient later uh, had a uh, treatment through a central line, that's the catheter that is seen on the right upper chest, and on this radiograph obtained about six months after the patient presented and was undergoing therapy, shows an abnormal lucency along the perimeter of the right hemithorax. Sam, could you turn on your microphone and discuss what are the possible explanations for that thin strip of lucency surrounding the right hemithorax? Um, thin strip of lucency around the right hemithorax. I'm, I guess when I see that type of description, I'm suspicious of, um, a pneumothorax, and so there's there's air in between the the lung tissue and then the um, the the wall of the cavity, and so yeah, that's right. that's I guess the only explanation I can think of. That's perfect. If you look on the lateral side of the right chest, uh, and you count down those ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in between the sixth and the seventh ribs you can actually see the pleural lining. It's a white, thin stripe 
that divides the lucency peripherally from the uh, tissue more centrally, which is slightly less lucent. It's air-filled lung centrally and pneumothorax peripherally. Normally, you would never see the pleura on a radiograph because the pleura should be opposed to the chest wall. The only time you would see the pleura is when it's outlined by air. Also, because we're looking at a lucent structure around the lung, you would never say that could be hemothorax or a pleural effusion because those would be soft tissue density, not air density. Here's a different child, a little bit older, who presents with a similar appearance on the CT scan to the patient we just described. This child presented with uh, sepsis, and the differences here are that there's a pleural effusion on the left, and the uh, abnormalities in the lung are more solid, and just a few of them have uh, cavities in them or air density, and most of them are soft tissue density. The appearance and the clinical scenario help to differentiate the first patient we saw, who has Langerhans cell histiocytosis, from this patient who has septic emboli. Here's another patient, three months old, who also has cystic changes in the lung. In this case, the patient had an abnormality on prenatal ultrasound and abnormal echogenicity in the left hemithorax. This was investigated after the baby was born by x-ray and then by CT showing a cluster of cysts on the left of varying sizes. This is called a cystic pulmonary airway malformation, which is an abnorm abnormality in the formation of the normal bronchoalveolar tree. This is treated with uh, resection of the involved lung. Finally, here's an eight-year-old who presents with this CT, also showing cystic changes both in the right middle lobe and also in the left upper lobe. This patient, unlike the prior three patients, does not have a neoplastic disease, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. They do not have a, uh, in a septic emboli, emboli, and they do not have a congenital lung malformation, the cystic pulmonary airway malformation. This child just has pneumonia, which results in cavitation of the lung and the formation of these cysts called pneumatoceles. So these three patients, all with cystic changes in their lung, have to be referred to three different divisions. The Langerhans cell histiocytosis patient had to be referred to hematology-oncology. The patient with septic emboli had to be referred to sept infectious diseases. And the patient with the cystic pulmonary airway, or congenital pulmonary airway malformation, had to be referred to pediatric surgery. So this is largely uh, what pediatric radiologists do. When a child presents with an abnormal looking scan, uh, the pediatric radiologist has to sort of guide the, the referral pathway. Which condition involving lung cysts involves lung cysts that are primarily unilateral? Uh, we saw examples of all these except for the, the uh, C, neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia of infancy, which actually doesn't involve lung cysts at all. Uh, two of those involve bilateral cysts, and A, the CPAM, involves unilateral cysts. Okay, I think uh, let's do this one. We'll have this one be our last uh, case. Uh, pediatric radiologists help guide the next diagnostic step. Here's a child who presents with hip pain and no history of trauma. The radiograph shows an abnormal lucency in the proximal femur. Uh, 
the uh, important things to note about this abnormal lucency are that the anterior humor, uh, fem femoral cortex looks like it has been eroded and along the anterior cortex shown on the right hand picture there uh, which is a lateral picture of the femur there is a triangular formation of bone right along the lateral uh, right along the cortex that's a phenomenon called periosteal reaction that's where the periosteum of the bone recognizes that there is something wrong in the adjacent bone and it's calcifying and trying to form new bone around this uh, around this process. This is an aggressive type of periosteal reaction called a Codman's triangle. When you see a triangle of periosteum like that, essentially the bone is buttressing itself, trying to heal itself against this destructive process of the proximal femur. There's a soft tissue mass that, uh, whose borders can be roughly uh, estimated by where that Codsman's triangle is. So the soft tissue mass that started in the femur and is extending into the soft tissues anteriorly is being buttressed by that Codsman's triangle, an aggressive type of periosteal uh, reaction. The next step here would be an MRI, and the MRI shows a destructive, aggressive appearing bone tumor, which was a Ewing sarcoma. Here's another patient with periosteal reaction. This is a two month old who was suspected of being abused, and they got a skeletal survey, meaning an x ray of every long bone in their body to make sure there were no fractures. The type of periosteal reaction seen here uh, is along the long bones, uh, the femurs and the uh, radius and ulna and the distal humerus, you can see it. This is smooth periosteal reaction. It extends from the metaphysis proximally to the metaphysis distally. It's of uniform thickness. It's bilaterally symmetric and it involves multiple bones. Unlike the Codman's triangle we saw in that femur, this is a normal physiologic type of, physio of, of periost periosteal reaction that is often seen in children and is of no clinical significance. Here's a child with tetralogy of Fallot who has thick periosteal uh, reaction involving the proximal, uh, involving the humeri, the clavicles, the scapulae, and the ribs. That's that shadow of bone density surrounding each of those bones. And this is the more abundant type of periosteal reaction that is seen in patients who are being treated with prostaglandin therapy. Here are two bone lesions that are similar to the uh, destructive lesion we saw in the proximal femur on a prior slide. But neither of these uh, lucencies, either the lucency in the distal fibula in the 14-year-old or the lucency in the proximal femur on the 13-year-old, neither of those has periosteal reaction associated with it. So the periosteum is not reacting to whatever process is happening inside the bone. That's generally a benign sign or a sign that the lesion is not aggressive. On the left, this lesion has not been biopsied, but it's felt probably to represent a normal developmental phenomenon in long bones called a fibrous cortical defect. On the right, this more hazy lucent lesion in the proximal femur is a fibrous dysplasia lesion in a patient with known multiple fibrous dysplasia lesions. So we saw aggressive uh, periostitis and a lucent bone lesion in a UA sarcoma. That patient needs to be biopsied. We saw non-aggressive periostitis in a patient who was suspected of being abused. That patient needs no treatment. That's a normal finding. 
and we saw a non-aggressive bone lesion in the patient with fibrous dysplasia, that lesion just needs to be followed to make sure it doesn't get so big that it causes a pathologic fracture, but does not need to be biopsied. So this is also one of the roles of the pediatric radiologist is to guide the next diagnostic step. Okay, we are coming right up on the end of the hour, and I think we will stop there. Do you have any comments, questions, or concerns? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That was a fun lecture. You're welcome. Well, thanks so much. So we'll see you. Um, are you lecturing for us again? Sabina, in the I coming week? I don't think so. I think that those are the two pediatric lectures. Uh, so unless you take this elective again, you will not see this lecture again. Well, okay then. Thank you so much. This was fun. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey, Dave. Thank you very much. That was terrific. Uh, that really hit the mark. And 